Hello and welcome to ERPM Note Log. Today I will be teaching you about inguinal hernia. If you haven't watched my video on introduction to hernia, please check out the link in the description below. An inguinal hernia occurs when the abdominal fat or a loop of small intestine enters the inguinal canal. The two types of inguinal hernia are direct and indirect hernia and it will be discussed later in detail in this video. This diagram shows the relative locations of the different types of hernia. Here we can see the sac of femoral hernia, the sac of indirect inguinal hernia and the sac of direct inguinal hernia. Anatomy of the inguinal canal. In males, as the testis descends from the abdominal cavity to the scrotum, it passes the deep inguinal ring which is a defect in the transversalis fascia, which is also known as the fascia transversalis. It is located deep to the abdominal muscles. The deep inguinal ring is located midway between the ASIS, which is the anterior superior iliac spine, and pubic tubercle, about 2-3 to three centimeters above the femoral artery pulse in the groin. The inferior epigastric artery lies just medial to the deep inguinal ring and is an important landmark to differentiate indirect from direct hernia. In the fetus, the testis continues to move medially and downwards through the inguinal canal and emerges through a defect in the external oblique caponeurosis known as the superficial inguinal ring and descends into the scrotum. When the testis descends, part of the peritoneum is pulled with it and wraps around it and forms the tunica vaginalis. This peritoneal tube does not fuse, so the bowel within the peritoneal cavity can pass inside the tube, even into the scrotum, giving rise to a hernia. Boundaries of the inguinal canal. I will explain this using the following diagrams. The anterior wall of the inguinal canal is formed by skin, superficial fascia, and the external oblique aponeurosis. The internal oblique forms the lateral one third. The roof is formed by the lowest fibers of the internal oblique and transversus abdominis, which forms the conjoint tendon. The posterior wall is formed by the conjoint tendon medially and the transversalis fascia laterally. The flow is formed by the inguinal ligament. Contents of the inguinal canal. In males, the inguinal canal contains the spermatic cord. In females, the inguinal canal contains the round ligament which ends in the vulva. The three important nerves of the inguinal canal are ilioinguinal, iliohypogastric and genital branch of genitofemoral nerve. The types of inguinal hernia are indirect, direct, sliding and pantaloon hernia. Indirect hernia originates lateral to the inferior epigastric vessels and passes from lateral to medial in an oblique manner. Direct hernia is an acquired condition due to stretching and weakening of the abdominal wall. It occurs medial to the inferior epigastric vessels. It occurs in the area known as Hasselbach's triangle. Boundaries of the Hasselbach's triangle the three sides of Hasselbach's triangle are the inferior epigastric vessels laterally, lateral edge of rectus abdominis medially, and the pubic bone inferiorly. The reason why Hasselbach's triangle is weak is because the abdominal wall at that place consists of only transversalis fascia covered by the external oblique aponeurosis. This diagram illustrates the boundaries of the Hasselbach's triangle. Sliding hernia. It is an acquired hernia which occurs due to weakening of the abdominal wall. It occurs at the deep inguinal ring lateral to the inferior epigastric vessels. When retroperitoneal fatty tissue is pushed down the inguinal canal, the peritoneum gets pulled with it and creates a sac. Since the sac has formed secondarily, it is different to classic indirect hernia. If it occurs on the left side, the sigmoid colon may get pulled into the sliding hernia. If it occurs on the right side, the cecum may get pulled in. Pantaloon hernia. When both direct and indirect hernias are present in the same patient, it is known as pantaloon hernia. Clinical features. Inguinal hernia is common in males. 
Patient presents with a swelling in the groin with dragging pain. Patient sometimes states that the swelling disappears in the supine position. Expansile cough impulse is felt in complete inguinal hernia. The content descends to the scrotum completely. We are unable to get above the swelling on palpation. There are certain clinical tests that can be done to differentiate between direct and indirect hernia. The deep ring occlusion test. First ask the patient to reduce the contents of the hernia in the lying down position. Locate the deep ring. I have the explained how to locate it of in the beginning the of this hernia. video. Occlude the deep ring with the thumb and ask the patient to cough. If the swelling appears medial to the thumb, then it's a direct hernia. If the swelling doesn't appear and if it appears after releasing the thumb and coughing, then it's an indirect hernia. The tests that are not commonly used are the ring invagination test and the Siemens test. Examination Do an abdominal examination to look for ascites, bowel sounds and benign prosthetic hyperplasia. Do a respiratory examination to look for chronic bronchitis and asthma. There are several important points that I would like to share with you. Always examine the opposite side. Always examine the testis. Always do per rectal examination. Always check the tone of the abdominal muscle. This can be done by asking the patient to do a straight leg raise of both legs at once and palpating the abdominal muscles to check the tone. The common differential diagnoses are hydrocele, lipoma of the cord, undescended testis, femoral hernia, inguinal lymphadenopathy, and hydrocele of the canal of nut which occurs in females. Investigations Inguinal hernia is mainly diagnosed clinically. However, certain investigations can be done. X-ray chest to rule out COPD and asthma. Ultrasound abdomen to detect ascites. Transrectal ultrasonography to detect BPH. Treatment Conservative management is for elderly people who are not fit for surgery and with a likely benign course. It is not the preferred form of management. For surgical management, herniotomy and tension-free mesh repair can be done. Since a mesh interferes with growth, it is not used in children. It can be done as an open or laparoscopic repair. The Lichtenstein procedure is an open surgery which is done under local or regional or general anesthesia. Laparoscopic repair is done in two methods. Transabdominal preperitoneal, also known as TAP for short, and totally extraperitoneal repair, which is also known as TEP for short. These procedures are usually done for bilateral cases or cases that recur after open surgery. If a patient presents with strangulation or obstruction, First, resuscitate the patient by fluid management, analgesics, and antibiotics. Perform herniotomy and repair. If bowel is necrosed, perform bowel resection. A mesh should not be used. Thank you for watching my video. Do you like the new look? Let me know in the comments below.